So welcome to the class again. Um, yeah, I'm recording the video now. So by the way, if you ask questions, uh, they'll be recorded. So, I mean, just to let you know. Um, so I have a few announcements regarding the exercises. Um, exercise zero deadline was yesterday and uh, we got some submissions. Um, I hope all of you have submitted. Um, so I sent a confirmation of receipt this morning at around 6.28 a.m. So um, if, you haven't, if you have actually submitted the work and didn't get the email, then you should let me know um, to figure out what, what has happened and so on, okay? And uh, I'm gonna grade them individually and uh, distribute it this week. Um, and there will be a tutorial for exercise zero um, on the 30th of October. Um, so please be there if you have questions. Um, exercise one is now published on the course webpage. Um, so you can take a look and um, what is it? Yeah, you can take a look and um, yeah, start working on that. Um, tutorials, we decide that uh, that's going to be um, on Mondays from 10 to 12 noon um, at 7E02. So that's downstairs. Um, so you should be able to uh, find them, find the room there. Um, we're going to record the ex exercise recap session. So um, if you, even if you cannot come to the course, uh, you can still watch it uh, somewhere could be YouTube or could be some private uh, platform. Um, anyways, the tutors will always be available on Discord so you can always ask questions. Um, there's gonna be a Q and A session after this lecture today um, by Arnas, uh, one of our tutors in the same room, okay? So we, we collected all the votes and uh, it turned out um, it's not the worst time either. So we just keep it as it is because also, um, it's nice uh, that uh, it's right after the net lecture, so uh, it's probably easier for you. So let's continue with the materials. Uh, last time we looked into generalization, um, development and deployment, as well as uh, how to do the splits basically to simulate the de development and deployment. And that's basically what uh, evaluation benchmark is trying to do. Um, so let's start the discussion with a, a bit of recap on what Evaluation Benchmark is doing. Um, for research and development, it's kind of critical because you want to um, know a priori what's actually going to happen at deployment time, right? Based on this uh, simulation, you can make uh, important design choices and decisions. Um, you can do model selection or you can even... Um, if you don't know whether you are progressing or not, it's very, um, yeah, you basically cannot progress basically because you don't know which ingredient is making you progress. And also um, it's kind of important in a competition because you wanna um, see how well you're doing against the competitors. You'll, you might also wanna um, um, convince the investors or something um, saying that, yeah, we are doing better than the others. Um, you can also simulate uh, different OD cases by coming up with different benchmarks. So in benchmark, benchmark one, you can simulate ID generalization. In different benchmarks, you might want to um, look into different types of OD generalization. Um, so key components are the data set, first of all, because machine learning is all about data. Um, what kind of evaluation metric are you going to use for the benchmark? And also uh, how to use the data sets, how to split the data and so on. And also um, the other types of information like um, whether you can use pre-trained model, for example, for competing in this benchmark. Um, if so, then what kind of uh, pre-trained model can you use? Um, and uh, for different scenarios, you might wanna come up with different splitting of your data set. So, um, in many cases, the development data is mapped to train plus dial splits. Um, the deployment is mapped to the test data set. 
and um, yeah, dev samples are where the model parameter is updated. Um, you also make hyperparameter choices and the design choices on the validation side in general. This is important because when you don't have a good separation of splits, then the machine learning problem could become very easy. If you have the, the identical duplicates from the deployment scenario in your development, then it's not about generalization anymore. It's not even um, IID generalization, it's uh, just memorization. Um, so that's trivial case. Easy cases when you have the ID uh, generalization, where the samples are kind of different, but also um, the distribution itself is the same, uh, which is also very easy. The harder cases are when, when the distribution is becoming um, different or you, you don't have so many samples from the target distribution. So these are medium hard, very hard cases. Um, so it's very important that we separate um, the deployment data from the development data. Otherwise, the problem is way too easy. Um, but here, one interesting note is that in many evaluation protocols, you don't actually care too much about how you, how, how you split the train versus validation data set. Uh, it's basically there to help you as a modeler to develop even better, more generalizable model, right? So how you split the train versus val is basically, in many cases, your choice rather than um, what is strictly um, prohibited or dictated by the evaluation benchmark. So. So uh, one could simulate the in-distribution setting by um, making the distribution for train val test identical. Um, the OOD cases when you have a different distribution for train plus val, val against um, the test distribution. Um, and uh, one, one thing to mention here is that the OOD generalization can have lots of different shapes. So the, the difference in distribution could be in all kinds of uh, different possibilities. So we're gonna talk about these different possibilities later on as well. So this is a side note on the split between train versus val. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what's the common wisdom for differenti differentiating these two and uh, what uh, can actually happen with the train versus file if you're crazy enough to do something new. So um, this is basically the, um, the usual wisdom, which is uh, the training is for training the parameters um, and validation is for validating hyperparameters and making design choices, which is more kind of a black box. Uh, more precisely, um, what do we mean by parameters, right? Parameters are trainable parameters in, let's say, neural networks. So there are linear layers, there are convolutional layers and so on, and uh, there are trainable parameters there, right? So these uh, like millions of billions of parameters are trained on the training set. And uh, there are certain hyperparameters uh, like the, the number of layers or uh, what kind of augmentation you're gonna use and what's the batch size, learning rate, uh, weight decay, all of these choices are, in many cases, uh, discrete. And also, um, you can you just decide them after, um, after training the model and checking how the generalization works on the validation sets. So in a sense, that part is more black box optimization and more human in the loop, right? Um, but uh, that's not necessarily the case because um, you also see uh, tons of papers on um, on using train val in different ways. So, uh, for example, you can tune the parameters also with black box optimization. Um, so I have one uh, this zeros order stochastic variance reduction for non-convex optimization. So you can you don't have to use SGD or uh, first order optimization for training the parameters. You can also use uh, techniques for training the hyperparameters for tuning the parameters. Um, and also for validation, um, validation, so, so the hyperparameters are typically um, very small dimensional, like up to 10 or 20 dimensions, uh, 20 um, degrees of freedom. 
but you can also train millions of hyperparameters uh, on the validation set with gradient descent yeah because uh, if you have millions of parameters then uh, it probably works better with uh, um, gradient descent right so how can you find uh, like millions of hyperparameters um, if you think about it, um, actually the training samples are themselves hyperparameters of model training. So actually anything that's not parameter when, uh, when you do machine learning is part of hyperparameter. So actually training samples are also in a sense hyperparameters. And here what this work is doing is um, it's tuning the training samples for generalization. So it's kind of identifying what is a good um, set of training samples. And that's uh, easily millions of or billions of hyperparameters. Um, it's not practical in this, so all the experiments are uh, on MNIST and so on, um, but just saying it's technically possible. And one could also do the optimization of train versus file splitting. Um, so you, you don't have to um, split the train val in an IID way. If you are really interested in making the model generalized well to new validation scenarios, you can also try to introduce the hardest case, basically. So you can uh, introduce an adversary who's splitting your train versus file in a, in a way that um, the generalization from train to val is very hard. What's the benefit of that? Um, based on this, you can uh, tune your hyperparameters or whatever um, design choices to make sure that the model has to generalize well to these uh, hard cases. Um, so there's work on that as well. Yeah, so the message here is that uh, train versus file is something that ha has a lot of exciting uh, research questions. And uh, yeah, I'm also personally excited about uh, these kind of research questions. Uh, by the way, these materials so far for train versus file is not examinable, just a side note. And back to examinable parts, uh, which is quite critical here. Um, so there is something called evaluation paradox. Um, so there is development data and there is deployment data. Um, and the deployment data should be hidden, right? Otherwise, uh, sometimes uh, it's hard to simulate some of the settings. So for clean experiments, you have to uh, separate them. Um, but the paradox is that if you don't have the deployment data, how can you measure whether the model is going to be um, doing all right in this new deployment scenario? Um, or how, how can you um, identify a priori uh, whether the model is going to be doing all right in this new scenario, right? And for that, uh, you necessarily have to pip into um, a few samples from the deployment, right? Uh, but the problem is that as soon as you see um, a few fraction of that samples, you're kind of violating the, um, the constraint, the, the rule. And so um, the problem is that when you have access to that small amount of samples, it may subconsciously um, change your behavior in the future as a modeler. Um, you know that, for example, this is not working well um, if you make this choice. And so uh, in the next batch of methods, you kind of change the way you do um, the training or include some samples that is uh, probably going to make, make it work better uh, for, the, for the samples that you have seen, right? It doesn't even have to be uh, like, even, even unlabeled samples could give you a lot of information because if you have a like one second look into an image, which is from the deployment scenario, and you just, know that, yeah, this is actually a scene of a mountain, right? Uh, for self-driving scenario, let's say. They knew, uh, you can quickly learn that, yeah, this is uh, applied to um, the new uh, kind of mountainous scenes, right? And then that actually makes you um, change your behavior as a modeler. Um, so there's an inherent uh, paradox here, which, which is that um, um, the observer, the observation itself is influencing the, the behavior. So um, I like to call this like an analog of Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle, because um, you have to somehow observe it, but once you observe it, then you're not measuring the same thing as you intended at the beginning, right? So there is a paradox here. 
Yeah, so when you, when you take a look at this fraction, then that um, is subsumed into the development data, okay? Which is a bit of a problem and there's no fundamental solution to it. You have to live with that. Um, I wanted to just mention that. Um, so let's also jump into further terminologies in machine learning, which is uh, also relevant for the course, but also um, could be helpful for reading papers, um, uh, for making discussions about uh, which setting you're using for doing machine learning and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about task, environment, domain, um, queue, feature, attributions, uh, content, style. These are all kind of terminologies that appear a lot in uh, OD generalization. Um, but to be honest, I, I haven't seen um, a good definition yet for all these terminologies. But uh, the thing is that uh, they also tend to be very redundant. So I think it's better to kind of go over each terminology and uh, make our own definition here um, for the course to make sure we are talking about the same thing. Yeah, this is kind of the starting slide uh, where we talk about um, generalization, gen generative um, learning and discriminative learning. Uh, because I wanted to mention this because uh, I wanted to introduce this factor Z, okay? So Y is typically the task and X is the input. Um, but uh, when you look at the input, there are many other factors other than the task itself. So all of these other factors, I call it Z. But eventually we are, um, our learning task is to infer Y from X, okay? But there are a lot of uh, nuisance variables coming in uh, in the form of Z. Um, so yeah, that is task, right? From X to Y is the task. And you can also call Y itself as a task. Um, task refers to what you're trying to solve. And um, yeah, these are all examples of tasks like uh, semantic segmentation. Uh, for each pixel, you try to assign a class label, or it could be classification where you assign the label to the whole image. Um, bounding box uh, prediction, right? Um, so you, you predict a class, but at the same time, you predict um, the four variables indicating where the object is uh, in the form of bounding box. There is also object detection, uh, which may uh, identify more than one bounding box per image uh, by, um, by retrieving all instances of every object that you care about. Um, instance segmentation uh, has more structured why in the sense that um, you have pixel-wise indication of um, uh, what the object is and what the uh, instance is. By the way, instance means uh, different entities of the same class. So the difference between semantic segmentation and instance segmentation is that uh, in both cases, you assign a label per pixel. Um, but in semantic segmentation, you only care about the class itself but in instance segmentation, you care about class and the instance, that's instance. So you make differentiation between these two different cats here, for example. Um, there are tons of examples from natural language processing as well. Um, it could be a uh, tokenization, sentence classification, named entity recognition, like identifying uh, which part of the text is, uh, is a person name, and which part of the text is uh, an address, email address, and so on. Um, word sense disambiguation. Um, you want to identify what the, the word really means, for example. There's also generation task, like um, generating the full sentence in different language, translation, uh, question answering, and language modeling. You just let the model uh, continue speaking, right, after some sentence. Um, the task can uh, also refer to something more um, fine-brained. So even within classification, um, you have different tasks depending on what are the subset of classes that you care about. So for example, you have Pascal, Pascal classes with 20 classes or Coco classes, which is a superset of Pascal classes with 80 classes. So these are two different tasks. Um, now there are terminologies like cues, features, attributes, and so on. Um, and basically, maybe they have different meanings in different contexts. But in this course, let's say these are all same concepts. Um, 
they're basically factors of variations in, in data. Okay. Um, so for example, we have three examples here, red circle, green triangle, and uh, blue square. So we have two factors of variations here. One is shape and the other one is color. Okay, so these are cues. Um, the task is a special case of Q in the sense that a task is the one that we care about in the learning task. So we can say the task is uh, shape recognition in this case. And uh, yeah, the Q is still color and shape, but task is only one of them, okay? And uh, the task is not inherent to the data. And there has to be a human who is defining what is the task here, which is very important because in some of the work, people tend to uh, assume that task is something that's inherent from the data, but it is not. We need a human to decide it. So here's an example of how um, the cues could be combined into a, uh, through a generative process to a, an actual sample. So when you have task uh, label of doc and all other kinds of um, attributes like product photo, front facing with alarm, um, wooden material, white background and so on, these are all combined into, um, yeah, these are all cues um, that makes this picture. Now there are further terminologies like environments and domains. Um, I would say these are still cues, different variants of cues, uh, but these are not necessarily critical for the task. Um, okay, so these are all other variations which are um, not critical, not uh, kind of causal, um, causing the task label to change. Uh, some people say instead of task versus domain, the task is the one that matters and domain is one that does not matter, right? Uh, in some context, uh, people, people can say uh, content versus style. The content is the one that's, uh, that matters and style is something that's kind of changing and does not matter for the task. So here's, the, here's an example of different styles uh, for the same content. For a clock, you may have different styles like clip art, product, real world. And if you combine these uh, three different styles, you end up with different images here. Why does it matter? Because um, this is uh, how OD generalization is sometimes framed. So you have the same content with different styles. And uh, the aim is to make the model generalized to a different um, distribution, which is defined by this different environment from clip art and product to real world. So, um, so far was the definition of basic terminologies. And now let's try to look into different learning settings and scenarios and benchmarks. So here we're gonna talk about ID generalization, OD generalization, and so on, okay? So I like to kind of introduce this diagram for, uh, for really explaining um, what different learning scenarios actually mean. Um, I think, uh, yeah, people should actually specify what, what they have for development and deployment in the fullest detail in order to, um, to really convey what they actually mean by the let's say OD generalization, for example, because if you just say the word, then um, yeah, um, people can just think of different stuff and um, eventually they, they do not um, talk about the same thing. So I think this diagram kind of helps specifying what, what you exactly mean by each terminology. So we have two stages, development stage and uh, deployment stage and uh, different scenarios. So the first setting is ID generalization, uh, where you have the same um, distribution between the first um, development and deployment. Uh, but obviously the samples for the first stage is uh, labeled and the second stage is unlabeled. Obviously, right? If these are labeled, then why do you do machine learning, right? OD generalization in general, uh, consists of some distribution from for the de development 
um, but a different distribution at deployment time. Okay. Now, um, domain adaptation is uh, slightly different. It still talks about um, domain generalizing, like generalizing to a different distribution. Um, but when you say domain adaptation, it means you have access to a few um, deployment samples during development. Okay, so you have a few samples here um, on the on the right side of the development here. Uh, unlabeled samples from domain two. Um, and you can basically utilize them for, for training the model or um, doing whatever you like. Um, this is often called unsupervised domain um, adaptation. But I, I like to just call this domain adaptation. And uh, this is domain generalization. Uh, where you now have the ability to tell uh, for the development samples. Um, for each sample, you know from which domain this is coming from. So let's say you have clip art and you have uh, product kind of photos, then um, you know for each sample, uh, what is it, right? Is it clip photo or clip art or um, product image, okay? I mean, it's obvious if you just look at the images, but uh, if you have millions of them, you probably need labels to, um, to make the models understand uh, where this is coming from. So typically in domain generalization, for each development sample, you have two different labels. One is the task label, and you have the Z label, which is telling you uh, from which domain this is coming from. So there is a bit of extra information compared to general OD generalization. Um, the hope is that when you have that, third information, which is the, uh, the domain label, maybe you can make, uh, make a machine learning model or try to come up with an algorithm which is making the model unlearn the, um, the domain information. So using this label, you can probably ex like exclude um, this domain information from the feature representation, for example. And that helps the model to generalize to new domains like domain four in this case. Um, there's also the concept of test time training. So here, everything is the same, except that the development stage is now um, extended to the de de deployment stage. And this is very close to what uh, real world looks like actually, because um, you, don't, you don't stop the development as soon as the model is uh, deployed. Just continue uh, looking at the metrics from there and um, you continue developing your model to fit to the real world cases. Um, but actually when you say test time training, you're uh, speaking more about uh, more specific scenarios in machine learning where uh, you try to um, match the statistics of the test time um, deployment samples statistics, um, you basically try to uh, match the statistics of your feature extractor to the um, to the deployment samples. In other words, I'm I'm basically talking about the um, the repository at the big at the bottom of the uh, slide, uh, which came up with the name test time training. Um, so so the message here is that after training your model, um, you can keep updating your model according to the unlabeled samples from the deployment environment. Um, so test time training is actually just using unlabeled samples from the deployment. Okay, but in practice, you probably do labeling um, on top of these uh, new samples and uh, further fine tune the, um, the model and so on. Um, so that's a little bit of difference between um, more realistic scenario and what this, uh, this test time training is talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, there is also a, a different variance of continuing the development scenario into the deployment. Um, there is continual learning. There are so many different types of continual learning, actually. Um, and one type of them is domain incremental continual learning, uh, which is assuming that um, the domains are actually coming in um, in sequence in the future. 
during deployment. And what you do is you slowly label um, these new domain samples um, as they come and use them for further tuning the model. So this is uh, actually what I meant uh, in the previous slide uh, where you do a labeling of a few samples and adapt your model to these new label samples. Um, from the training, from the development to deployment, the task may also change. Your target task is something different eventually, um, but you may also train on a different task um, during training, which is called zero-shot learning. How is that possible at all, right? With language models, it is possible, actually, because during training, language models are trained for um, sentence completion or sentence continuation. Uh, but at test time, you can also give instructions in natural language format in the prompt, and the model uh, can do much more beyond just sentence completion, right? So that's an example of zero learning. Uh, sure. Um, so that's a specific case of uh, zero learning, I would say. Uh, you may still do zero learning um, for retrieval task, for example, which does not require um, extra samples for the downstream task. Um, I'm probably gonna, gonna talk about uh, more examples later. So yeah, maybe, maybe it's better to answer your question there as well. So now there's Keisha learning, um, which is more realistic in many cases, because now you have K different samples for classes for your task. Um, during development, but of course, when the K is smaller, it's harder. And uh, people also say one-shot learning or two-shot learnings to indicate, yeah, we are solving a very hard problem. Yeah, so the example is uh, you do image net pre-training, for example, and then um, you do downstream fine-tuning based on the K samples for class. Um, there is also the concept of meta learning, which is very closely related to K shot learning. So, meta learning is learning to learn, right? So, um, you say learn um, to indicate the fact that you're learning a task, right? But learning to learn means uh, you're kind of doing some meta, meta learning, yeah. <laughs> um, you're learning how to how you can learn quickly in new um new tasks basically right so one one very popular way of doing meta learning is to come up with a good pre-trained model where you just need to do a few steps into the new um new task to achieve a very good performance in this new task right so that's kind of um preparing your mindset in such a way that you can learn whatever new subject you wish to learn right so that's one type of meta learning. Um, so naturally, for meta learning, you need to have access to many kinds of different tasks um, during during development <laughs> stage, and um, you learn the rules here how to learn new tasks, and then eventually you wish that um, when you encounter a new task, task four, um, you only need to do a very easy, very quick uh, adaptation to this new task to do well in this new task. Yes, please. Um, can you probably repeat the question I didn't? Sorry, auto ML. Um, So AutoML here, what you mean by that is um, hyperparameter optimization. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I see the relationship here because um, 
when you do uh, AutoML. Um, so there should be some design choices for AutoML as well, right? Uh, like whether Bayesian optimization works better or uh, whether um, simple grid search is the best choice and so on. So probably those choices are uh, something that generalizes across different um, tasks. And when you learn this bit, these uh, hyperparameters for AutoML, um, I would say that's also part of um, meta learning per se. Or did you also um, mean something else as well? Then this kind of. Uh... Yeah. 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 I think, yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a relationship. Yes. Okay. Um, again, uh, there's continued learning um, in this, uh, when, when new tasks are arriving during deployment and uh, um, one type of task in incremental continued learning is class incremental continued learning where new classes are arriving um, every time period. Like, for example, if there's a new product that has not been there before, like um, iPhones and now um, Apple glasses, right? Then you have to kind of add this new class to the set of classes to recognize this new object. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, foundational models and uh, the ML settings. So now the big difference is that the training data is massive, billions of trillions of tokens, right? Um, and the deployment environment is most likely, um, so where do they actually get the data from, right? They get the data from the web. And uh, in many cases, the benchmarks are already embedded in the web. And so it's very likely that the, um, the training data set already contains quite a bit of benchmarks out there. And so if you measure the performance of those large language models, for example, it's very likely that uh, it has seen those particular test cases. The same was actually true for, uh, for face recognition systems uh, a few years ago, because um, there are only 70 billion, sorry, 7 billion people around the world. And um, if, you're, if the training data for face recognition system is already in the order of billions, um, then it's not, probably not so meaningful to measure the performance. Uh, on new individuals or, or zero shot learning tasks, right? Because uh, it's not zero shot anymore, probably. You have seen the person before. Um, so, so the question is, is that a problem? And should we do something about that? So I like to uh, answer this question in two different perspectives. In reality, it doesn't matter because um, the fact that you, you can actually see all these training samples and memorize them in, in the parameters is already a very useful technique. Um, you can think of that as just a trainable database uh, where you can do uh, retrieval in a very efficient way. Um, but there is no guarantee. So I, I say it's untrustworthy database, but still this is very useful because you can get an answer to your questions very easily. Um, I don't care if that has been memorized or not. But uh, but from a different perspective, from academic perspective, and also from the competition perspective, like different companies are coming with dif different uh, language models. And we have to identify which companies producing the best possible language model. Um, there is a bit of a problem because um, we cannot do fair comparison anymore. Depending on whether the model has been trained on specific benchmark, the performance will be highly variable. And so from that perspective, it's a bit of a problem, um, but there is no good solution here either. Um, and also foundation models are very much related to um, the concept of transfer learning. Um, so let's talk a little bit about transfer learning here as well. Um, so in development, uh, there may be multiple training stages as well. Um, 
you may train on a few sequences of upstream tasks until you reach the final task that you care about, the downstream task. Um, and at deployment time, of course, your task is to solve this downstream task. Why do you do this? Um, because you want to improve performance. You don't have so many uh, samples for the downstream task, but you have tons of samples for upstream tasks. Then you, you may benefit from the tons of samples from the up, upstream task, even if it's not super relevant for your task at hand. Um, and also maybe the target task is changing very quickly. And so you have to quickly adapt to it. And uh, it probably doesn't make sense to um, train from scratch every time, but you have a fixed model, which is already trained on upstream task. And then you only have to do a few more iterations for this downstream task. Sure. So you use the same dog but put it in the development stage, right? As a deployment stage. Because they're kind of like independent problems, you just put it back for each end. Ah, it's the same task. Sorry about the, the difference in color. Yeah, same task. Um, so, so the good thing about uh, this transfer, transfer learning setting is that you may actually not need to do the, uh, the training on the upstream task. You can just download them because they're so universal um, that they're uh, available. They're, they're, there's a strong demand to make these models available to everyone. And so big companies do the service right to the community by making them available to everyone. And um, I, I've put some links here for computer vision and natural language processing, where you can actually click on it and download those, uh, um, those models. So in computer vision, uh, the most popular one is PyTorch, but I love to use team models as well, because um, yeah, I like the person behind the, the team library actually, uh, who is Ross Whiteman, and um, he's, a, he's a VC basically, he's an angel. Um, investor in technologies and he did all this team library for hobby. Um, he has his personal GPUs and uh, initially he tried to uh, yeah, train the models. Um, and these models are super nice. Uh, he came up with all the, uh, the right ingredients for training those models and they are sometimes working even better than um, what the authors event uh, authors originally came up with. So he has done very good service to the community. And now team library is also part of Hugging Face. And also naturally Hugging Face contains very good uh, libraries for, um, for computer vision, but originally um, natural language processing. So you're also gonna find very good pre-trained libraries there. And now, um, we can probably take a break now and um, see you in five minutes.
Yeah, I hope the microphone is working because otherwise the voice is way too small. Um, <clears throat> but some people nowadays do uh, self-supervision objective where you do not use uh, the class labels for training the model. Um, and this self-supervised objective um, is starting to give you even better um, downstream performances than the, than the class classification objective, which is sort of counterintuitive because you're using uh, less information, uh, but you're somehow getting better, uh, better performance eventually, perhaps because the downstream is kind of unrelated to the image net classification task. But to be honest, I don't know. I don't know what is the reason. So what do we mean by self-supervised objective? Um, one possibility is to match the views, meaning that uh, you do two different aug augmentation of your image or distor distortion of your original image and uh, pass them through the network and you have some embedding for that image for these two views. And uh, your objective is to match them as much as possible in the um, in the embedding space, but if you just have these kind of loss, then um, uh, your network will eventually learn to put everything to a single point, right? So you need some uh, negative samples as well to to pull them apart, and these negative samples are coming from the other images. So in a sense, uh, your task here is to identify which patches of the same image are coming from the from the same image versus which patches are coming from the other images. So you're kind of building a new task here uh, from, from, the, from the pixels, where the uh, only information is how the pixels are separated across different images. Um, so that's one example. Um, for languages, um, there are more natural tasks that you can do. Uh, for example, there is a BERT training, which is doing mask language modeling. So when you have like tons of text, what you do is uh, you, you delete some of the, or hide some parts of the sentence and make the model guess what are the, what are the hidden tokens, hidden words there. And uh, if, you don't, if the model is trained on like billions of such cases, billions of tokens, um, then the, the model also learns uh, how, how the sentence structure looks like in general. And um, um, the representation learned this way is also helpful for all kinds of tasks like sentiment analysis or machine translation and so on. Um, so apparently learning this helps. Learning, um, learning to fill in the blank helps in many other language tasks. Um, they also have the objective of ne next sentence prediction, uh, which is kind of similar, but um, also different because now the context is on the previous sentence and you need to predict the future, future sentence, how to continue your, your generation. Um, so GPT is doing, uh, doing basically just future prediction all the time based on the previous tokens. Uh, you do it autoregressively, meaning that you generate a token and then um, in the next iteration for generating the next token, you have the first generated token as part of the, um, the inputs to, to the model for generating the next token. And you iterate that. Um, it sounds very inefficient, but somehow this is uh, giving you very good capabilities for the model to generate uh, the next token super well and also have emergent behaviors where the model is now capable of doing mathematics and um, all kinds of stuff, you know. So that was for the pre-training bits. And um, these are non-examinable because you can just download them. And for now, you don't have to care too much about how to do it. You are not at a, such a big company, right? So you don't have the resources for doing that. Um, but what matters is how you do uh, what to do with the downstream task, because that's fully what you can actually do, um, even with your laptop, right, for example, in some cases. Um, so I'm going to talk about downstream task and um, different ways of doing 
tuning, fine tuning, partial tuning, um, no tuning. So, um, so I was surprised to learn that uh, a lot of people will confuse uh, what fine tuning is, right? So, um, fine tuning means uh, in practice, it simply means tuning all the, all the parameters in the model, right? So uh, some people think fine tuning could also mean um, partial tuning and so on. But yeah, in, um, in everyday language in machine learning scientists, fine tuning just means you're tuning everything. Um, so this is also non-examinable. Um, this is what I mean by uh, you can train your model on your laptop. So there is something called LoRa and even QLoRa, which is quantized version of LoRa. Um, you can do fine tuning of a big your network with a very um, small amount of resources, GP resources. Even CPU may work as well. Um, that is uh, done by um, making surrogates parameters for the original model parameters. Uh, by doing um, low rank approximation of the original network. And you're just tuning um, those small number of parameters which are kind of defining, which can be expanded to the, to the whole parameter. Um, and by doing that, you reduce the memory consumption for the, for the entire network by factors. And uh, in some cases, you see demonstrations showing um, you can actually tune billion scale um, language models on your laptop. Um, there is also partial tuning. So the most popular partial tuning, I would say, is uh, last layer tuning. Uh, why is that? Because anyways, the last layer cannot be reused in many cases. The number of classes will be different in many cases. Uh, ImageNet has 1,000 classes. Um, but uh, let's say if you want to use that for my own application where I have 30 classes, then you cannot use those thousand classes. So you have to replace the last layer at the very least. Um, and also this is the popular um, evaluation methodology for self-supervised learning in computer vision. It's also called linear probing. I'm not very happy with this naming, but um, because linear probing also means something else in hashing. Um, but uh, there is apparently no clear um, nuclear connection here, but just people call it linear probing for unknown reason. I don't know the reason. You can also tune only the input layer. Maybe you still have to do the last, last layer tuning because the number of classes don't match. Um, but you can also focus more on input layer training if you expect some changes in the downstream task where, uh, where the low level features are kind of different. In fact, you can uh, choose whatever layer you like um, in the middle and just tune only that part. And depending on what kind of um, changes you see at test time uh, for the downstream, um, some people argue, for example, this paper argue that uh, you may choose uh, a different layer to tune and probably that gives you better um, downstream performance. I, yeah, I found that quite interesting. And now, um, so now the change from, from this to this is that now the input has, uh, has something called prompt in the front. Um, so prompt means um, these are kind of instructions you give to the model to make the model understand what to do with the input. And in some cases, the model has the capability to understand um, the prompt, right? Uh, for that, you should have trained a model with some prompts during training, which is the case for language models. You're training with a variable length of sequences. And um, since it's variable length, you can put whatever length of prompt uh, for, your, for your model input. Um, for vision, you have to do something more involved, like uh, putting a, a boundary around your image as part of prompt. And um, you have to tune the model to actually understand this uh, boundary bit as some kind of instructions to do something else, right? And so on. There, there are some papers on that as well. But anyways, uh, let's say you have some prompt bit for your input vector. 
And uh, I would say that's still part of the model parameters because you can tune it and um, it defines the model behavior. Um, so people typically do two different types of uh, prompt tuning here. One is black box, the other one is more gradient based. Uh, when it's black box, people call it prompt engineering. Uh, when it's gradient based, uh, people call it, yeah, uh, prompt tuning. But here I wanted to say, uh, this is a typical um, prompt engineering. And you see a lot of these uh, ChatGPT cheat sheets these days, and they tell you uh, how to formulate your prompt um, to make it do what you want. So these are actually good examples of how you do black box optimization prompt. You get you have a human in the loop, basically. You're in the loop and um, you figure out what is the best prompt. Yeah, prompt tuning. Um, so this is a nice diagram um, showing what prompt tuning is doing. There's model tuning, which is also known as fine tuning um, because the model is tunable. But instead of tuning the model, you're tuning a small bit in front or at the end of your input, right? And attach that into um, uh, to the input text and that's given to the model. Yeah. So there are variants where you do not do any tuning as well. Um, so one, um, one possibility is that the model is just a feature extractor for doing non-parametric machine learning um, algorithms like k nearest neighbor classification. You just register a bunch of um, samples to the network. And what you do at test time is you just um, pass the test sample in, through the network, get the feature vector, compare the feature vector against all the, all the it's called gallery samples or training samples, I would say. Um, but there is no parameter. And uh, you just dis decide uh, which class is the closest to this uh, test sample. And that class becomes your prediction. That's also a typical way people do self-supervised learning evaluation as well. So this is yeah, valid approach as well. Um, or maybe the downstream task is just a retrieval task, in, in which case you don't need to um, do any parameter tuning. An interesting case of um, no tuning is uh, in-context learning, called in-context learning, um, where you are actually giving the, the training samples as part of the prompt and um, make, making the model um, find an analogy and do the same thing for the, for, the, uh, for the new input where the user wants the output for. So for example, if you want to translate English to French, you just tell the model to do translation from English to French, but you don't just stop there, but also give some um, examples like sea otter is l'autre de mer and so on, right? And then now the task is to turn cheese into something. So that was it for the for the scenarios, and um, we learned transfer learning, um, all kinds of generalization scenarios, and so on. Um, what I think is also important is to connect all these concepts to real world scenarios. Does it actually matter in real life, right? For us to argue that this actually matters, we need to attach each case to a real world example. So I like to, so this is also very important when, when I come up with the new scenario and try to argue to the reviewers um, saying, yeah, this is a new scenario, very exciting. And this is actually highly relevant in some cases. And this is such a case, right? So I think this exercise is very important for, for the course as well. Uh, we had a, a couple of such questions uh, for the exam uh, last year. so. Um, so here we have an example of, um, yeah, let's read it. <laughs> I don't remember what, what the answer for this is. Um, so development resources, you have multiple image database, D1 to Dn with the same task of classification um, or the same set of labels. 
And the data set consists of IID samples from distributions P1 to Pn. Um, not saying that P1 to Pn are identical, but um, each sample from P1 to Pn, these are kind of IID within, the, within these, uh, these distributions. And the distributions are pairwise different, of course. Yeah, every sample is labeled in each data set. For each image, you know which data set it belongs to, right? So you, you have um, a separate label here indicating uh, which distribution it's coming from. Um, and you have also collected a few labeled samples, um, Bn plus n, right, for the deployment environment, uh, Pn plus one. Um, and now the deployment environment is basically um, Pn plus one, which is different from any of the distributions before. So yeah, I remember it doesn't have a dedicated name, right? But what is important is to come up with a good real world scenario that's relevant for this kind of setting. So yeah, there's no answer to that. Like you have to come up with your kind of answers basically. Uh, um, you can yeah, come up with um, some examples there. And this is a new topic, uh, which is information leakage from deployment, which I talked a little bit about before as well. Um, according to domain generalization definition, um, which is defined by the diagram here, uh, information about domain four should not be available during the development. When it's available, then either you're violating the assumptions here, or uh, maybe you should not call this domain generalization anymore but call it something else. Um, so it should be a very tight, closed machine learning system. Um, but you see in practice, a lot of leakage. So some example is um, you make some hyperparameter choice based on the samples from domain four, right? Uh, or you can also even just visually inspect domain four samples and make um, design choices. So this is such a case study here. Sure, yes. Um, so domain and distribution, I would say they are the same concepts for this course. Okay, yeah. So I wanted to walk you through um, through some case study here, where you do information leakage without being super obvious. So this is an ECCV 2020 paper on domain generalization called self-challenging, um, self-challenging improves domain, sorry, cross-domain generalization. I give you a brief overview of the method. So, um, so that's the original objective of just doing uh, empirical risk minimization. You get the gradient. Uh, for some layers that, right? And then you decide that, so I'm talking about here now. Um, so now you decide uh, for each uh, vector, so, so gradient is a vector, right? And you just determine for which index um, the value is greater than some predefined threshold, QP. And uh, if it's great, then you just decide to mask it, right? So that's a binary mask and you just, put a mask around, a uh, mask on that layer features, right? If the gradient is large. And then um, these features are now fed into the original network and the final prediction is made. And for that new prediction, you get a new gradient, okay? So this is supposed to be helpful for domain generalization, so to say. But um, I'd like to identify a few uh, hyperparameters here, which is not, um, not super obvious from, from just reading the method itself. So one hyperparameter is, uh, is the layer here. Is it gonna be the last layer or a middle layer? Do um, you wish to drop the top activations or top gradients? In this case, it chooses to use some layer Z, which is not specified yet, um, and decides to mask the top gradient. And the second hyperparameter is uh, 
which percentage to drop. So how to set the, uh, set the QT threshold. The other, the other hyperparameter is, um, um, so they don't, they don't apply this for every batch, but only for a percentage of batches. So how, how, how should be the percentage here, et cetera. The thing is um, they're tuning the hyperparameters on the test split. Um, they don't explicitly call this test split. In that case, we have a good way to tell which, which split is test split. Test split is the split where they report the final result and compare against the other metrics, okay? Even if they don't call this test, it's still test, right? Uh, for ImageNet, there is no official test split. It's not available to public, um, but people do final evaluation on the validation split, in which case we call the validation split the test split. So test split is not something people call test split, but something that plays the role of test split, okay? And what do I mean by tune? Um, tune does not always mean um, doing gradient descent, but uh, from broad perspective, um, looking at the test split results, the decide design cases. This is a, an action of tuning. Um, when they tune on the test split, then we say the test, test information leaks. So these are examples. So it's, it's evident when you look at the tables, actually. So this is the table where they compare um, different feature dropping strategies, whether they um, don't do anything which is baseline or they drop random ones, or they drop the top activation or top gradient. Um, and the numbers there on the right side, these are all um, final numbers they use to compare against the other methods. So these are test split results. So they are making a design choice here, uh, which is the top gradient eventually, based on the numbers here, which are used for comparing against the other methods. So this is an example of information leakage. Likewise here, they show the results on the test split um, and they make the choice of dropping percentage based on that number, which is again, information leakage. Likewise here. So they, they show like tons of tables here, um, each for making one design choice. And uh, all these numbers are based on the test split. So seemingly nice ablation studies, yeah. Nice, but um, there's information leakage. So can you still call this domain adaptation, sorry, domain generalization, right? Um, it's highly um, dubious. And um, in typical machine learning uh, review rounds, um, they argue a lot about this, right? Um, whether you should call this domain generalization or uh, you should call this something else or you should do the validation in a kind of held out set, which is different from the test split and so on, whether uh, the comparison is fair or not. Fortunately, the paper has uh, not been, um, has not met such a review, I guess. And uh, it's now part of the ECC paper. I mean, uh, it does not necessarily say the paper is bad, but um, there are some remaining questions here. So, so sure, yes. So if you look at the paper, actually they use these numbers to compare against the other methods. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is the solution here? So selection of these hyperparameters and making design choices should be part of the development, okay? It should not be done uh, with de deployment data. In other words, um, the use of validation split should be part of the method as well. This is what, uh, what this paper, in search of loops domain generalization is arguing as well. The selection of hyperparameters matter a lot. Um, otherwise, you s so what this paper is saying is that um, there, there has been some seemingly very good uh, um, progress in the, in the field of domain generalization on, on tables, right? 
But if you have a sober look at the numbers and if you do the right hyperparameter tuning, um, then you don't actually see much um, development, much progress in this domain beyond the, uh, the simple baseline of doing um, ERM, empirical risk minimization. So in the future, um, the validation should also be part of the method. And um, there should be some dedicated health outset for making those uh, hyperparameter choices. That's the message here. I said more in the evaluation part of the lecture, but uh, please ignore the line. <laughs> it's an old artifact. So let's summarize part one, um, point one. Uh, we talked about measuring generalization by setting up different benchmarks, uh, where an important part is to split the test val um, test, sorry, train val test. And we talked about evaluation paradox here. Um, some learning scenarios we've looked into. Okay, so let's jump into the, to the second part of OD generalization, Q selection problem. Um, let's look into cross domain generalization again. You have different domains, um, and then you have to generalize to unseen domain. Um, so there are many examples of such benchmarks, uh, like tax data set, uh, where we have photo, art, painting, cartoon, and sketch. So each time you do leave one out evaluation. Um, so for example, you train on photo, art, cartoon, and then test on sketch or in different combinations. I'm going to show you like different uh, types of benchmarks in this domain. Like um, there's domain bad, uh, which is yeah also similar. You, you show um, different data sets from different domains. Well, uh, in this case, you are actually combining uh, all kinds of such benchmarks as well. So there's tax, tax is part of this benchmark. Uh, VLCS is also something similar, but um, uh, it's under this umbrella of domain bed. Um, there is also WILDS benchmark, where we have um, some shifts from test training examples and test examples. Yeah. There is ImageNet C. So there are many ImageNet variants actually. Um, so ImageNet C is when you have, um, you train on normal images and then at test time you have some simulated corruptions um, like Gaussian noise, noises or some blurring. Yeah, ImageNet AEO, these are also popular um, variations of ImageNet benchmarks. Uh, which is a collection of failure cases of ImageNet. So you're looking at a very harder um, part of this, of the original distribution of ImageNet. So these are um, kind of domain generalization in general. Ah, I think I skipped some slides, yes. <laughs> so what makes cross-domain generalization dif difficult, right? So. I, I'd like to talk about two factors and focus on the second factor. So first factor is uh, uh, when the domain changes, right? The, it, it's kind of in a new region in the input space. And since there has been no example around that point, uh, the model does not know what to do with that. So I would say the model has, shows very high, uh, highly undefined behavior for this set. And so it's hard to make any guarantees or um, make any guess even um, on how the model would be doing it, okay? Um, the second factor is that uh, maybe by training on, um, on the existing domains, the model picks up some cue which is not essential for the task. We call these uh, spurious correlations. And this is something we can perhaps address better by making the model choose the right cue, okay? So, uh, because the first one is something that is not fully controllable, I like to focus more on problem two, which is more controllable. Um, and for, for studying that, we amplify uh, the second factor quite a bit um, by considering something called cross-bias generalization. So this is an example of cross-bias generalization where you have two factors of variations. One is a task. So let's say the task is to predict shape. 
and um, and the other factor, which is color, is um, is a spurious correlation. So your training set looks like uh, the diagonals here, where you have red circle, um, green triangle, and blue square. So in your training set, these two factors are always changing together. And so uh, whatever factor the model chooses to do the prediction, you're still going to get 100% accuracy. So the training set is not telling you which Q is the right Q to look at. And in those cases, typically the model chooses to use color, actually. No model uses uh, shape because that's harder to use. Um, the problem is uh, now, um, let's say the test set considers uh, all possible variations of color and shape, right? And the model just chooses to use color. But let's say the task is shape recognition then the model will fail to generalize well to the, the test case. So this is the typical, typical example of the second case that I mentioned before. The model is choosing to use a different queue. That's not essential for the task. Um, and I call this uh, cross bias generalization. So in a diagram, it looks like that. Yeah, training set looks like that, and test set is, uh, is like that. So let's say, uh, okay, so let's talk about bias uh, for, you, for a second. Um, I'm defining bias as a queue that is not integral or call her for, for the task. Um, but at the same time, it is nonetheless uh, correlated with the task. So there's a bit of difference between, um, between bias and domain as well. Domain may not necessarily be bias, if the domain is not something that's, uh, that's usually helping the model to do the task in the training set. But bias is really something that really catches the attention of the, of the model and uh, misleads the model to, to think this is the very strong cue that the model should be looking at. Um, it's also dependent on what is the final task, right? So if the task is shape, then color is a bias. If the task is color, then shape is a bias if the, if the model chooses to use um, shape, right? So as an antonym of, uh, uh, of the bias, uh, people sometimes call it signal Q as well. Yeah. Yeah, again, um, here we have an example of a um, case where the task is ambiguous. So we now have three, three um, factors. Uh, color, shape, and size as well. And here, um, the task is ambiguous. If you're just giving the model um, those, those diagonal samples, um, because in each case, you're still going to get 100% training accuracy. So at test time, in deployment environments, you get a new kind of sample with a new combination that you haven't seen before. Um, any three of these. Uh, answers are good, but uh, depending on what answer you get, you may actually be able to identify which queue the model is looking at. If the, if the model says prediction for that one is one, then, um, then it kind of means uh, the adapted queue is probably scaled, right? Because um, yeah, in the training sample, small, um, small shape used to get, um, Plus one, right? Label one. So, and, and so on, right? So the key message here is that um, with only these kind of samples and no extra information, um, cross bias generalization is not solvable. It's an ill pose problem. Um, there's lack of information. It's called under specification. Uh, we say that some setting, machine learning setting is underspecified if from the, from the data alone, you cannot figure out what is the task, right? And there should be some extra information to, um, to specify the task. And uh, in many practical scenarios, you face a lot of, yeah, underspecified um, machine learning settings. And there has to be some extra human input extra information to um, 
to make this clearer. What is the task, right? Uh, we say this is a feature selection problem. Um, yeah, because you have to select the right feature to generalize well to a new um, to the deployment scenario. I'd like to briefly mention about shortcut bias or simplicity bias. Um, even if all the cues are giving you 100% accuracy on the training set, there seems to be some consistent ranking of cues that models prefer. So this is a paper that, uh, that I wrote with um, someone called Luca from my previous um, place, right? And uh, we, we did the experiment of um, giving models all equally good choices like color, shape, orientation. Um, also for faces, the, the gender, um, identity, age, all kinds of cues. And let the model choose, uh, choose the cue for recognition. And um, it turns out the model has very consistent choices like color is preferred to shape, to scale, to shape, and then to orientation. So, and it's more or less consistent across VITs, uh, convolution neural networks, MLP networks, and so on. So maybe there's something inherent uh, to the data itself rather than the inductive biases or whatever in the, in the model. So we came up with the concept of, um, um, data complexity or task complexity. And uh, we hypothesize that uh, models prefer to learn simpler um, cues to the other types of cues. And we call this shortcut bias, um, the model's inborn preference for simpler cues. Um, the question is, is this something bad? Maybe not. It actually depends on the task. Um, there has been tons of reports in machine learning saying that uh, the factor that actually makes the deep learning generalize is exactly the simplicity bias. Because the model, like there are tons of millions of billions of hyperparameters, sorry, parameters in the network. Um, but the reason why the network is still generalizing well, if, if the data is not as much, is because there's an inductive bias for the model to focus on simple cues. And so there is kind of, yeah, inherent generalization in the net. So there are people saying, yeah, simple cue is better. We also have uh, reports saying, but if you just focus on simple cues, then probably it's not good, right? So what is right, right? I think uh, both of them are right. So this is kind of showing that. So. Um, let's say these three cues are relevant for the task. Um, I would say for ID generalization task, simple cues are probably the best solution here uh, because that makes you generalize well. Um, and uh, that corresponds to a lot of um, deep learning scenarios that we consider. Um, but for OD generalization, sometimes the simple cues are the ones that, um, that hinders the, a good generalization. So in that case, it's bad. Um, also for fairness, I wish to mention a bit of fairness here. For fairness question where, the, where there are some sensitive attributes that the model should not be using, right? Um, model still likes to use some simple cues which are not allowed for the models to use because they're simply simple. Um, and we should probably make the model choose something else than these simple cues. So the conclusion here is that simplicity bias is good and bad. In some cases, like ID generalization, probably it's good, but for OD generalization, perhaps it's misleading the model to look at uh, irrelevant cues. So um, I'm gonna give you some examples of more shortcut biases. They're very entertaining. Um, so in vision, there is something called context, context bias, where the model is not looking at the foreground object, but the background to make the prediction. So here, um, you see like, this is the typical office background. So even without looking at the keyboard or monitor, you kind of 
know that there should be a keyboard or, or monitor. So that's another spirit correlation here. Um, on the right side, so in each case, you are kind of removing the one object at a time, right? And uh, measuring how well the model is recognizing the removed object. Okay, so in the second case, you the model knows that there should be a person, right? Because it's yeah, if there's a frisbee and there's a green background, then it's most, most likely there's a person who's playing frisbee. And even without frisbee, the model kind of knows that there should be a frisbee. Because the person is doing this action and uh, looks exactly like playing frisbee. And there's a famous texture bias, which came out from uh, Tübingen as well, Tübingen AI Center. Yeah. Uh, where the model turns out to use more texture cues for recognition than shape cues. Um, in uh, natural language processing, also um, there's been quite some reports saying the model does not actually understand the structure of the sentence, but just looks at um, the word, like a bag of words. So if there is a word like the doctor pays the actor, then just the model thinks, yeah, doctors pay the, the actor without understanding the, the structure of the sentence. This also happens with GPT-4 models these days. I ask it to write an email to someone based on uh, some emails changed between two people, and then it completely confuses uh, who has to send an email to whom, right? And, um, and mixes it up. There's also action recognition cases uh, where the task is to, um, to identify what kind of movements human is making. But obviously, the background is giving a lot of information about what the person is doing. So yeah, this is an interesting quiz time where you do not actually see the person, so you don't know what the person should be doing. Um, but you know from the background what, what is the most likely answer here. Yeah, gymnastics and golf and so on, right? <clears throat> And also in VQA, when you have two different modalities, uh, for example, here, you're asking, given a picture, ask uh, what are the, what's the color of the banana? And um, yeah, in training set, you probably see a lot of yellow bananas instead of green. So uh, even without, even if you don't give an image in these cases, the answer is normally yellow instead of saying, I don't know, right? And I'd like to uh, mention briefly a feature selection problem in fairness as well. Um, I'd like to say this is fundamentally the same problem because, uh, yeah, before that, I'd like to um, define equality of opportunity perspective. It's a notion of individual fairness that people who are similar with respect to a task, right? So there are some uh, task related um, factors of variations. If they are equal from that perspective, then they should not be treated differently according to other sensitive attributes like race, gender, um, you name it, right? And this is exactly the case when, when you have to um, select the right features or make the model select the right features. Um, so let's say the task is to predict the possible future default for an individual. And uh, I would say the task queue, what is allowed for the model to use is like the size of loans, history of repayments, income level, age, and so on. Uh, but what seems to be a bias queue in this case is the disability, gender, ethnicity, religion. Uh, so whatever humans decide um, in some discussion, uh, what should not be actually used for, for making such a decision. Um, so that's it for today's lecture. Um, if you have questions, you can come to me later on um, after the lecture. Some action items. Please send your preferred group um, to the email by 29th of October. And uh, yeah, you can start working on exercise one. And here are some, uh, here's the link for your feedback. Thank you.